And the goal was to get uh, refractor quality out of a Newtonian. That was the goal. That was the goal. Refractor quality as I could possibly make it. Yeah. Well, it's a, this is a basic Newtonian. It's a 12 and a half inch uh, mirror, uh, F8 focal ratio. Just uh, a longer version of what most people have. Um, seems today um, the thing to go is aperture and, and short focal length for, for more sky. But um, I, uh, I'm a lunar planetary observer. So this, this um, scope was designed as a, uh, a lunar planetary instrument. That's the, the nature of the, the F8, long focal ratio. And the tube is an old vintage park tube that I found and restored and baffled and darkened. So it's all about these high contrast views, high resolution right. views. And also, also uh, we have a, a small two inch quartz 30th wave diagonal for the 12 and a half, which is pretty small, but it, it yields a smaller uh, obstruction, which gives me a little bit better uh, contrast in the image. And it does, it, it does uh, the views are very, are very good on, on a good seeing night with uh, the objects up pretty high with minimum atmosphere. So I can remember that view you showed me a while ago with Jupiter that looked like a Voyager photograph through yes. this. You had that well baffled scope, there's no straight yes. light, the diffraction, the yes. minimum. And if you get good air, good sky, and the objects are pretty high, then you can get pretty spectacular views out of the telescope. So, Although it's limited. So how, how is the scene down here in Florida? Right? Well, it's been good, but the, the wind has been high and it tends to buffet the tube because it's so long. So I try to shield that as much as possible. That's why I'm back here in the woods a bit. And um, the mount I have is an English oak. And I- Like all good mounts? Yes. And I went with that because it's inherently a stiffer type of mount because it's supported, the yoke is supported at both ends. And it works very well, even in the wind. And it has a right ascension drive on it with basically friction type brakes on it so you can set the degree of the brake depending on the wind or no wind and you just simply grab the handles and put it where you want it and let go and it tracks it works pretty good and you made this all yourself I made it myself but I had friends I had a friend that owned a machine shop that helped me machining all the parts I had another friend that had a woodworking shop and with fairly big machines because with the yoke they had to be fairly precise and square to work on um, that's all sort of box section. Yes, they have stretch. minimal minimal orthogonal error. That worked out good. So um, it took about maybe a couple months to build, but it's been under co continuous improvement ever since it's been built. There's always something that can be done to improve it. And that's the beauty of making your own scope, isn't it? You that, can... Well, the beauty there is that I built the exact scope that I felt I needed for what I was trying to do, which you can't buy anything like this. So. The question is, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of work to move it, set it back up again, tear it down. So, being some winter star parties a week long, it's well worth the trouble yeah. to do to do that. But for one nighters, I have a refractor that I use for that makes sense. for things like that. Yeah. So, and I look forward to the to the week in the in the Keys with the winter star party. It's a great event, and it's it's great for this. There's plenty of space great people there's always somebody coming by to help me build it you know yeah. to assemble it because it takes about three people to assemble it without damaging it yeah. you got to be kind of careful should so. we have a closer look at the mountain then there's what do we got at the drive end and sure we can i have stoves built into it so it doesn't go anywhere in the wind so we'll pull the stoves so we can move it around and being that there's no wind we can we can release the brakes a little bit right ascension brakes, declination brakes. Now that we have the brakes released somewhat, the friction brakes, it's fairly easy to move around. Look at that. You just, it's all balanced, perfectly balanced. You're moving that with one right finger now, there's, there's no, um, bino, it designed only for bino viewers. So right now there's not a bino viewer on it, so it's out of balance. But with the bino viewer, I can adjust the trim weight in the back. So are you Basically. rotating the whole tube when you do that? Yes, this is a rotating tube as well. I don't think you could do it without a rotating tube. To orient the, the vinyl viewer exactly where you needed it, depending on what side of the mount you're on. But yeah, it's outfitted with a batter, uh, 30 millimeter aperture vinyl viewer. And I use a uh, mostly pan 24s. It gives me six tenths of a degree of field at hundred power with wow. a 12 and a half mirror. So even on the moon, that's pretty spectacular. And um, I've been, I've been um, viewing it magnifications up to 500 
really on the moon. So I literally look at crater walls, <laughs> and that's and that's ideal conditions. You know, good seeing, low wind, uh, and it w does quite well. I so I have the Telrad here, which is covered because of the sun. Yep. And then I have this 15 by 80 uh, telescope on my telescope, and I have this on because at 100 power. My field of view is only about six tenths of a degree. It's very narrow, so it's very hard to find the fine fuzzies. So this being an 80 millimeter, once it gets bore sighted to the telescope here, you got a, you got about a three degree field here to work with with yeah. the crosshair eyepiece. So as long as you can find something within the three degree field, you can just bring it to the crosshairs, which are already aligned to this, yeah. and then you have the object. So so this is not a go to. This is what I call a hunt for. Yeah, hunt for. I like so you that. have to know what you're doing to find things. It will not go to anything. That's the thing. You, you, you push it. You are, you are the go-to. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> and anybody that walks up that happens to be a sky authority is, is, uh, is an asset. <laughs> then we see a lot more things, <laughs> you know. And so, it's really only good up to like 10th magnitude because it's a 12 and a half mirror, you know, practically speaking. Yeah. But it's designed for the moon and the planets, which are very yeah. bright. So. And so what were you saying? Sorry, you've got a heater on the secondary. Right, and the there's a heater on the secondary. There's a heater for the Telerad. There's a heater for this finder here as well. And then but you've got a thermocouple hanging off that right. that measures ambient right. air and, and adjusts the power? Yeah, what the dew buster does is it, if I adjust it for five degrees over ambient, then the dew buster uh, regulates the heat source to the secondary and the finder here to keep those elements five degrees over ambient. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it regulates everything else in the same way. And with the fan running, that's the most you can do. In Florida, it can be pretty dewy, so that's the most you can do. And also there's there's the heaters for the eyepieces as well. Oh, perfect. And this is designed for bino viewer. So when this telescope was laid out with the secondary, the the length to the eyepieces was designed with the bino viewer in mind. So you reduce about five and a half inches from the overall. So if you were to put a single eyepiece in this, you'd have to put a five and a half an extension out here to get a single. But otherwise, you plug the bino viewer in directly without any kind of a glass path corrector. Oh, I see. Because that's just one more element in the train that causes distortion, and you lose fidel you lose, yeah. op lose optical fidelity. So it was designed specifically for bino viewer use. I plug the battery in here with two 24 pans, and I get 100x at six tenths of a degree, and um, it's very it's a fairly bright view because the exit pupil is about three millimeters. So whether you're looking at the planets of moon or and Andromeda or Omega or just about any other optic, it's pretty spectacular. Oh, wow. Because aperture is everything. Could we have a look at the motor drive? Because sure, you made that as well, over, didn't you? Over this side here. This is so, all homemade. This is what I find yeah, incredible. Right. It's all, all homemade. homemade. This is a, a Delrin gear that was machined out of a basically a square piece of stock that I flattened. Uh, went on a CNC to cut around. And then there's a way you can use a spirally fluted uh, tap on a lathe. To machine oh, in so the, that cut the teeth. To, to machine in the teeth, and this is just a, a regular worm machined out of stainless steel. And the brackets for the drive. This is a stepper motor that has a gear drive built into it, so it's like 80 to one. And I think the overall ratio is like 475,000 to one. <laughs> so this turns 400. This the stepper motor turns like 430, 475,000 steps for every one day that this turns. So it's pretty fine. And that was to minimize microphonics back to the tube. Otherwise, the stepper motor actually shakes them out. You have to get it going pretty fast. And this is my variable speed drive that's just, I bought a, a regular card as far as a stepper controller and put a 10 turn pod in so I can precisely trim the speed for stellar, planetary, or the lunar speeds. Uh -huh. across the sky. I, can, I, can, I can look at the lead lag of the object and adjust it so it's perfect. Okay. So that's just a sort of fine motor yeah. control. The challenging part is doing the polar alignment on the mount. Oh, how do you do that then? That's, well, I have a polar alignment scoper on this side here that's, that's been collimated with the, the axis of the yoke. If you can imagine the axis of the yoke. So this has been collimated to that. So basically, you know, you, lo you have to basically, initially before it gets dark, kind of point this in the northern direction, you kind of got a guess of where it is. And so by the time it gets dark, you locate Polaris in the polar alignment scope. And then to get it exactly where it needs to go, I got these four levelers, these four leveling. Oh, points, I see, yes. On blocks and stainless steel pads. And that's how you can control 
this elevation here and as far as this direction you can you can slide it on these stainless steel plates and move these blocks around so that's how you can pull it on it takes a little while to get it in but once it's in then it's pretty much set and that's it done and it's really just an observing platform so the polar alignment doesn't have to be super accurate but for you know magnifications of 200 to 300 pound times you want it fairly accurate so the object stays tracked in this small field of view of the telescope and th that's achievable with this with some work so for alignment i have this series of diagrams here okay and what i do is i look for the position of the big dipper and cassiopeia in the sky okay and then based on their positions and also this polar alignment scope it flips left and right so it's inverted left and right but not but not up and down so this, this tells me where to put Polaris with respect to these, the end stars of these two, based on the orientation they, they uh, have with respect to the north, north uh, celestial pole. And that's how I can, that's how I basically get the polar alignment set. So what's been your favorite view of the staff body so far? I would say, I mean, is anything that I look at in the sky or? Oh, with this telescope. Oh, well, Saturn is spectacular. Yeah. Uh, the Cassini division, and on a good night, you can make out the Inky division. Oh, wow. And you can make out bands and rings. And on Jupiter, the goal is uh, the blue festoons to, to, to see those so what's on the a blue, good night. So what are the blue festoons? The festoons are uh, eddies um, due to the differential speed of the bands on the planets. Wow. And they're swirls. So they're blue. And on a good night, you can make those out. Oh, fantastic. At like 200, 300 power. Right. And then you have features on the moon, which are spectacular. So, and that's, and that's been your favorite so far this week. Right, in the morning, because there's really, you know, you get Jupiter setting. So, yes, the moon in the morning. So, how long did it take you to build this? Do you reckon, start well, to finish? Well, um, I think it was like four months to get the basic structure together. Right. But then it was changes to the motor drive, changes to add addition of the cooling system. Cool. So, there's a fan that uh, draws air out the front and exhausts it out the rear. So, it's drawing it down the yes. tube. Yes, past. Trying to defeat the the, um, the 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 currents, the air currents Inside within the, the tube, tube that are yeah. coming off the mirror as it's cooling it, trying to defeat those currents, and also an attempt to trying to bring the mirror back to ambient, which is a two-inch mirror, so it takes a while. Wow! Right, but when everything's right, the mirrors cool down or equivalent to the ambient, it works very well. So you haven't got any thermal currents coming off the mirror. You yes, know. but initially through the daytime heating of the of the mirror, and then when it starts to get dark it, it cools down kind of fast and so the mirror is always lagging it so there's you know like maybe I'll just work at less magnification until things come to equilibrium oh, okay. and then by the time that maybe uh, some of the more interesting objects are in view like yeah. double stars or things like that so you, you're not doing the Orion so you're not doing the Andromeda galaxy yeah we we started that in the first thing because that's over here in this part of the sky and it sets pretty early so we start with Andromeda, we go to Orion, and any any large clusters that we can find, things of interest, uh, star splitting. Fantastic. So go through the telescope, then you've got a really good mirror. Yes. Long focal ratio, so you mm -hmm. get really nice coma-free views. Mm -hmm. Tiny secondary. Yes. Thin spider. Right. Yep. Primary cooling. Right. Yes. Flocking. Baffling. Baffling, right. And the mirror started out as an Edmonds. Oh, okay. Uh, 12 and a half F8. Because the first mirror I made, I dropped and I broke it. <gasps> so I wasn't yeah. going to start all over. So I started with the Edmonds. An so you started stuff. grinding and then dropped it? Right. Yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah. And it was done. So so I bought uh, an Edmonds 12 and a half F8. Somebody sold me one because they heard that I broke my mirror. So, And then my goal there was to super polish the, the mirror. Get it to super polish and then to super figure it. And oh, so you, fi you figured it yourself? Yes. You, oh. And then post interferometry, it came out to... Um, uh, a 95 plus Strel and a 24th wave. Goodness me. Right. But it's all, you know, it's all a function of gravity and the mirror cell and everything as well. So a lot of things come into play there. So fantastic. But it, it, it's a good, it's a good um, instrument for what it yeah, does. Yeah. And obviously this is set up for Florida. You can't go, yes. you can go traveling with it. So. Right. Um, as far as the latitude, anywhere from Northern Florida to here in the Keys. So you're talking, you know, 24 and a half degrees um to upwards of 29 degrees and then that's just off the jack right. screws at the back and i can just use i can just use cement blocks if i have to lift uh, up the back course. end to go to northern florida right now you can see the front end's higher so right about st pete where i live it, it less, it's pretty level 
But as I go further north, then I have to start jacking up the back end. Uh -huh. So at some Good. point, it becomes impractical. Gotcha. But it was designed for Florida, so. Perfect. The solar panels part so this, of the system. Oh, so the solar panel charges the Yes, it, it battery. charges the whole system. Sorry, the battery. Yes. So I have a gel cell uh, that basically runs the system all night as far as the heat, if I have to have the heaters running, the fans and so forth. And during the day, then I can charge it back up. So it's totally solar powered. Self-contained. Self-contained, yep. Perfect. And it's been like this for years. So you can see how black that tube is, though. Yes, it's you very just, black. You if just you got can't this mirror see, looking back at this. Yeah, if you can't see the sides, that's good. That's what you want between the baffles and the blackening. So you have fl flocking and. I have flocking, blacking, and and baffles. Really? Yes. So there's every, no street every, light in there, is everything. there? Everything. I mean, everything. It's a bright, sunny day, and you can see yeah. the light at, at this end around mm -hmm, the rim, mm -hmm. but you can't see anything else. Well, it's interesting when I was. Installing the baffles in the tube, which was a challenge, because I had to work from both ends, and I had to I literally crawl in the tube to set the baffles with super glue, and then to caulk them in. So 12 inch F8, yes, yeah, so it's right. an eight foot long tube, isn't and it? And I had to make the baffles out of 30 thousandths G10 on on a router table to router out each baffle. And you know, each baffle is a different size. It goes according to a formula as to where they're located. All to do with the ray angles. So it's a unique size of the baffle and a unique position in the stack. They ought to be precisely positioned and then glued and sealed in place. And that was a job. Cool. Thanks for your time, Bruce. You're really appreciate it. You're welcome. Cool. Can I take a picture of you next to us? And sure. Then... Oh, gosh, I'm melting. <laughs> Were you facing the sun? No, I was facing the sun. Because it's so big, I've got to get miles away.